today we're gonna find out how far the Polestar 4 long range dual motor can go on a full charge of battery. But maybe more importantly, we're gonna find out if the new software 4.2.1 has fixed the terrible add-as functionality the Polestar had the last time I drove it back in October. Have Polestar managed to fix the issues with auto stair, where I experienced lane bouncing, big delays in activation of autopilot, and also the annoying bing every time the system engages and disengages. Have Polestar fixed the dangerous phantom braking I experienced every time I passed a truck in the left lane with the old software. Have Polestar actually managed to fix all these and more added issues with software 4.2.1? The short answer is yes, they have fixed it. Is it perfect? No. Is it a lot better? Yes. Would I consider this good enough? Yes, but I'm still hoping that they're working on it. I hope they're not watching this video and thinking, okay, we fixed it, on to the next thing, because in the Polestar 3, it's better, it's smoother. So one of the big problems I had with the Polestar 4, like early when I had a press car in like August or September, passing trucks in the right lane, going 120 kilometers in the left lane, it would break, like kind of phantom break, like with the Tesla, watch my previous video about the Tesla Model Y to see how an ADAS shouldn't work. But here, passing three trucks, no issues at all. It's confidence inspiring, it's not nervous. There's no lane bouncing, it's not hesitating. It's just keeping the left lane, trucks are here. Yeah, I passed probably like 40, 50 trucks on my way to this point today. No issues, not even one hesitation. So that's completely fixed. Another issue was that when you were driving, uh, and changing lanes with ADAS and it would re-engage here. It would like snap into place, like a little bit scary. And it wasn't smooth, like it's like gliding over and then suddenly it would snap. Not an issue anymore. There's small amount of like correction when it hits the lane. It's not like super smooth like with a Polestar 3, but I mean, that's good enough. That is, that is superb. The biggest issue with this is still the small delay from when you activate something and also if you want to increase the speed uh, quickly after you re-engage it. The same top uh, button on the D-pad here is tethered to the one pedal drive, but uh, if you're aware of that, you can you know work around that. So it's not perfect, but it is so much better. And also before, uh, if you like uh, try to correct the car in the lane, it would you know disengage and it still does that like there's not a lot of mount until it disengages like there but it doesn't bing and bong at you every time and cancel so that audible warning every time it engages and disengages like with a tesla that is gone so for you guys who saw my previous video the tesla model y and think oh i'm just complaining no i'm saying it from my perspective driving on this road more than 100 cars probably 110 115 cars to pass four and a half years now and every car gets the same treatment I drive it on the same stretch of road and this is how you do it like if you're watching that Tesla video and thinking oh you're complaining well if you want to live with the binks and bongs and the phantom braking and the uncertainty and having to use auto lane change every time this is so much smoother and less fr less frustrating and you're allowed to con concentrate on the road and pay attention so yeah so they pretty much fixed it like it's 95% there but give me the extra 5% and I can go out and confidently say that this could be one of the best you know uh, advanced driver system systems out there so we're back in the Polestar 4 this time a long-range dual motor non-performance on 20 inch wheels and after about 40 kilometers on the road our average consumption is 26.1 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers not the lowest but not the highest we have a uh, crosswind from the east today, about a meter to two per second. So maybe we're gonna beat the, <laughs> the consumption we had with the performance version back uh, in October or December. I'm hoping so. And also new to this uh, range test is also instrumented road noise testing. And I've already done measurements at 80, 100, and 120 kilometers an hour, which I'm gonna reveal at the end of the video. But I can say confidently that this is one of the quietest cars I've tested. And compared to that Tesla Model Y uh, I drove yesterday, that new model, you know, the Juniper, 
this is a lot quieter. I mean, it's significantly quieter, significantly more comfortable, and also these seats are superb. The driving position, like, I'm just comparing it to that car because I just drove it recently, and some people are like, oh, you hate Tesla. No, there are a lot of positive things about that car, but there are just more positive things about this car. Though the price may be not one of them compared to that Tesla Model Y. So, so far, so good. A good update with this new software, and it is promising. Yeah, good job, Polestar, good job. Remember my idea about traveling to the US for warm weather testing of new EVs like Polestar 3, Volvo EX90, etc? Unfortunately, we didn't raise enough funds for that trip, but we still raised around a thousand euros, so we're going to Spain instead. The plan is to travel the first week of April, and I've already booked a Volvo EX90, Polestar 3, Polestar 4, and I'm awaiting confirmation on the A6 e-tron and Porsche Macan. If you want me to test more vehicles, let me know in the comments section down below. But but a thousand euros is still a very tight budget for me and a videographer to stay in Spain for a week and also to travel down and to have enough money to eat, to feed ourselves. So if you want to support the trip, every donation, big or small, is much appreciated. So if you want to donate five euros so we can, you know, get a hamburger or 10 euros or maybe 20 euros so we can get a proper meal, please do so in the link down below everything i mean every donation big or small is appreciated and also everything donated to this trip is going to be spent towards the cost of the trip this is not a vacation this will be one week of intensive testing to get out these warm weather tests before the weather gets warm here in norway so guys thank you very much and now on with the video for most of the trip, I was running the cabin at 21 degrees Celsius, but it's gotten a little cold. Yes, I'm just wearing a sweater and not a jacket, and it's four degrees Celsius outside, so I turned the cabin up to 22 degrees Celsius, and now it's more comfortable. I have the heated steering wheel on setting one, and also the heated seat off. So, we're now here at our turnaround point, so we're halfway, and we're gonna go underneath the motorway now, and then we're gonna enter on the southbound direction, and then head back towards where we started so halfway our average consumption is now 24.4 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers so it's dropped a little bit and it remains to be seen if it will drop more if it will stay the same i think if we can hit like 24.0 i think that is actually not bad at all so we're gonna take a left here now enter the motorway and uh yeah we're gonna head back towards also the weather today pretty decent i mean overcast a little bit of sun popping through the clouds and also for the most part dry roads yeah it's a nice day not the best day but it's a nice day to be out doing a range test i may be misquoting myself here but i kind of remember me last year when i drove the polestar for the different versions talking about if it wasn't for the annoying ads features the adapter cruise control auto steer that was far from finished this would be a great car maybe not a perfect car but a car that i like a lot today i think i proved myself correct because adas adapter cruise auto steer has been basically flawless yes there are a few instances where the car was nervous passing a truck when it was like entering the motorway and also like when you're disengaging auto steer when you're changing lanes there's kind of where it unlocks just like a tiny bit it's a little bit weird but other than that this trip has been so nice it's quiet it's comfortable the interior is nice the visibility is great the steering is nice the switch gear is nice it's just a nice car to interact with yeah i really like this polestar 4 and this is now on a campaign price with this long range single motor with the pilot package the napa leather interior etc etc and winter wheels I think it's like 740,000 kroners. I think for that price, yes, it's more than a Model Y and it's more than a lot of other cars, but it's so much better in a lot of ways. These seats are great. I mean, yeah, I have very few negative things to say about this car except for how they market it and also like the packaging is a little bit weird with it being a coupe SUV. I talked about that extensively, so I'm not gonna, you know, yap about that here. So we're now back here. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna connect to a charger, no preconditioning, no heating of the battery, 
just connect and see what speed we get after a few hours on the road and letting the battery heat up itself passively. We do preconditioning in another test called the long trip test. So that will be in a few videos. I'm going to film that next week. Uh, we don't do that in this test because this is all about getting the maximum efficiency. And if we precondition the battery, that means using energy to heat up the battery. So guys, the consumption was not as low as I was hoping, but still, 24.4 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. That isn't bad actually. The charge port is here on the driver's side and it is electrically operated. And usually I'm not, you know, a huge proponent of that, but I think this one is fine because it's simple in operation. It tries not to be fancy. And also it's just been working like uh, without any issues, even uh, in the cold when I've had this car. So I had a little bit of issues with this charger earlier where I had to hold the connector or else it, uh, you know, wouldn't uh, want to communicate. I think, you know, this connector here is probably a little bit worn. So we're doing what we used to call the Phoenix contact, the Phoenix connector dance or handshake or whatever. Yeah. Haven't done that in a while because these uh, charging providers have been really, you know, good at uh, switching out these connectors when they get worn. So taking a little bit of time to initialize here. I think we arrived here with 42% uh, state of charge. And we're gonna see what speed we get now after, you know, just letting the battery heat itself. Uh, this car does have active preconditioning by the navigation system. Uh, it didn't have that the last time uh, I drove this car because, because of the software update, there was a bug that uh, removed that feature, but I think it is now uh, back. So it's gonna be interesting to see what speed we get now. Uh, if you don't, you know, navigate somewhere, if you forget to uh, precondition the battery, we're going to see what speed we're going to get now. Yesterday with a Tesla Model Y, the new model, actually quite impressive. That car got like 140 kilowatts uh, without preconditioning the battery, though at a lower percentage, 32% uh, state of charge. That car also has a higher peak charging speed, but not at a CCS charger. You have to go to a Tesla supercharger because they output more than 500 apps, which is, which these, you know, CCS chargers are limited to. So it's, it looks like we're not getting a good charging speed, 76 kilowatts. That isn't good, but it's kind of expected when you don't precondition the battery with temperatures today of around four to six degrees Celsius. Before I reveal the range, we were able to get out of this Polestar long range dual motor today. Let's take a look at the results of my road noise measurements. So in these range tests, I've started to do road noise measurements now with proper equipment, a proper microphone connected to my computer here with proper software where we measure the road noise in a graph over time and then we extract the average during every session and then we accumulate that for the different speeds to give us the actual measurements on different types of roads but always on the same roads for every car so a lot of other channels they have you know these cheap handheld devices where you have like your live readout and they do like that and they give you results so those are so inaccurate unless you have a graph where you actually ex extract the, the average uh, readout those measurements are at best misleading or at worst just totally pointless and useless and, 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 and so false in their information. So just take those with a grain of salt. I've waited for a long time to do it properly here on the channel because I want to do it properly. I don't want to mislead any of you. So before I reveal the results, I just want to check if this car has double pane glass. No, no laminated glass. This is a single pane of glass. So yesterday in my last uh, range test where I tested the Model Y and talked about road noise, I talked about the myth where people think that, you know, double pane glass reduces road noise a lot. It doesn't. So most of the road noise, especially here in Northern Europe, is tire noise. So it comes from the underbody of the car. It comes from the wheel arches or the wheel wells. And then it comes from the lower parts of the doors, like the sills down here, that makes a, a tight seal to subdue that road noise. But a lot of people think that, you know, having double pane glass or laminated uh, front windscreen will reduce the tire noise a lot. No, that only helps for the most part with wind noise. Maybe it's gonna take a little bit of, you know, that tire noise away, but this car is a very good example of one of the quietest cars we've ever tested here with double pane glass. And I, I don't think adding that would have helped, you know, the results a lot, maybe a little bit, but not noticeable in a, a measurement. So 
At 80 kilometers an hour, we did two measurements and our average readout was 62 and a half decibels. At 100 kilometers an hour, we did three measurements with 65 decibels average readout. And at 120 kilometers an hour, we did three measurements with an average readout of 67 decibels. So I think this is the third quietest car we've tested here on the channel. And compared to, again, that Tesla Model Y I tested yesterday, this is substantially quieter. Like at 120 kilometers an hour, this is like three decibels quieter. This car at 100 kilometers an hour is quieter than the Tesla Model Y at 80 kilometers an hour. That says a lot. So yeah, good job Polestar making a silent cabin and a comfortable car here. Now let's find out what range we were able to get out of this car today. So we take the usable battery capacity, 94 kilowatt hours, we divide it by the consumption, 24.4 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, and then subtract 3% for heat and discharging losses. That gives us a theoretical range under today's conditions of 376 kilometers, which actually is, is quite good. It's 65% of its WLTP rated range. Not bad during these conditions. It's still cold today. The average temperature, five degrees Celsius. But if we're gonna be completely fair, and then again, compare this to the Tesla Model Y, which we have compared it to throughout the video, this has a lot higher consumption. I think this is about four, maybe a little bit more than four kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers more. So when it comes to a pure efficiency standpoint, there's no comparison. The Model Y, the new model, is a lot more efficient than this. But remember, this has a much larger battery. And maybe the conditions today were marginally better, a few degrees you know, warmer and drier conditions, and maybe less of a wind today. This car, in the real world at these speeds actually got almost 20 kilometers more range and that difference is going to be larger if you go at lower speeds this car has a higher penalty the faster it goes because of poor aerodynamics and less efficient uh, electric motors less efficient drivetrain and more weight so at lower speeds that difference is going to be a lot bigger and i can keep and I keep comparing these cars because when it comes to Tesla and Polestar, I think these are the closest in the range. And also this car with the campaign price it has now, if you remove like the leathers, which you can't even get in a, you know, a, a, a Model Y, this car is actually very close in price to that here in Norway. It may be different in your market. And for me at least, they've now fixed the Addis issues. This car is so comfortable and quiet to drive, which I have, you know, demonstrated in this video and in the real world, yes, it's less efficient. So if you really care about how much you're paying, um, this isn't the car for you. But I think for everything else, this is a, a better package. So if I were to go out and buy a new electric car today between 700 and 750,000 kroners, I think honestly, I'd, I'd go for this now that they fixed most of the issues I had with this car. I just can't think of any other car at this price point that is better. Maybe the Volkswagen ID7 GTX Tour, but that's less luxurious, smaller battery pack, less performance, but it's also about 100,000 kroners less money. So, oh, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. It's more practical. I really like that ID7. I got to test, I have to test that again soon. Let me know guys, what would you choose this, the new Model Y or the Volkswagen ID7 GTX Tour? Let me know in the comment section down below. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please drop me a thumbs up down below and for more car content, as always, please subscribe. See you guys later and goodbye.